Unleash the power of your mind. Wear a levity, raw, edgy, humorless apparel for the discriminating activists. Live free or cry. Welcome to another episode of Mind Matters, the talk program that provokes critical thinking, logic, and reason. We encourage all of our listeners to use their common sense in all of their decision making, especially if it involves an issue that you think is important or one that affects your liberties and God-given rights. Welcome back to another episode of Mind Matters with my co-host, Dan Ploger and myself, John Krotek, to talk about a, a subject and an issue that's kind of quietly gone away. And that's the um, the BLM movement when it was at its height and, and what's happened to it since. And we'll talk a little bit about its formation, what happened with BLM, and then maybe the reasons why it did what it did. Or, or Let's just look into that because we really feel like when you have $2 billion worth of damage and you have insurrections taking place or not just in one city, but the entire country, it's something that needs to be looked at. So let me introduce Dan. Hey, Dan. Welcome. Hey. Hi, John. Um, good to see you, man. I know I've been out of town for a week and uh, it's good to be back in the saddle with you again, Dan. Um, just to give you some background, BLM was formed loosely in 213, I think was the first time that the hashtag Black Lives Matters um, was used. And Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi formed this organization after the killing of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of George Zimmerman. You know, they were outraged. Um, yeah. and, and, and everybody was outraged. You know, whenever there's a senseless killing and somebody's not brought to justice, we have to wonder what was really going on there. But let's fast forward to, to 2020. And something that was horrific that everybody saw, nobody doubts it. The justice system took care of it. These police officer are, police officers are in prison for the crime that they did, but was the killing of, uh, of George Floyd. And everybody witnessed it. it, was on a cell phone, and it was horrific. Should have never happened, regardless of what he was doing, uh, what George was doing. He, that shouldn't have happened. And, and, and most sane people... And people that respect law and order would agree. But what happened in 2020 was beyond anything that I have ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, these peaceful protests that took place during the summer of love all across America. And, you know, there were some peaceful protests in quite a few communities around the country. But in general... Uh, there was major looting, major fires, rioting. Some people were killed. Uh, small businesses were destroyed. Over $2 billion worth of damage, damages um, to primarily small businesses, but also to a majority of Black-owned businesses across the country, which was interesting. Um, and the cities include Minneapolis, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Nashville, Salt Lake City, Cleveland, Chicago, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Raleigh, Louisville, Washington, D.C., Richmond, Dallas, Birmingham, Denver, Portland, Seattle, Des Moines, New Orleans, Baltimore, Detroit, Kansas City, Omaha, Las Vegas, Trenton, Austin, Albuquerque, Fargo, Oklahoma City, Madison, Wisconsin, and, and several other cities uh, people turned out uh, to protest the killing of George Floyd. And while many of them were being touted as peaceful protests, I think a lot of us saw the CNN broadcast where the, uh, the editorialist was saying, hey, everything's peaceful here as we witnessed a fire behind him. So they were anything but peaceful. And we talk about insurrections. I know that January 6th has brought, been brought up time and time again. And that was probably not an insurrection because the insurrections that I saw were fires and destruction everywhere. So was that a 
well, that's for a different discussion. But but here's here's the here's something that's even more interesting than the fires and the destruction that took place, but the money that was raised by BLM. And in 2020, they raised $90 million. A lot of this from uh, corporate sponsors, you know, to include Coca-Cola and Google and, you know, companies that, that, that have major iconic brands were actually funding destruction. Um, so they, they, they raised 90 million and they listed $42 million in assets at the end of 2020. A lot of these with mansions owned by the leadership of BLM. I mean, come on, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to think something's askew. And then in 2021, they raised only $9 million according to the records. And of course, they listed $30 million in assets. $30 million in assets, you know, primarily properties. So enough of the introduction. What, what we would like to, to investigate in our own thoughts is what we think BLM actually became. May have started out with the right idea, but what it became and where has it gone? Has anybody or is anybody being held accountable for those missing funds and for all the destruction uh, that took place, you know, during those riots and, and mass lootings? What do you think, Dan? I mean, that's the introduction. What's going on here? What In your mind, give me your synopsis of what BLM was all about. Well, it, it's a it's an organization that w was set up. Um, aligned with the neo-Marxist uh, attitudes uh, that prevail on campuses and, and seem to be popular among many young people. Uh, so right away, it's, <laughs> it's something that I would not support, in, in fact, would unsupport, de-support, I should say. Um, the other thing that I've always found puzzling is what was the uh, alignment of BLM with Antifa? How how do those two organizations work together, at, which they did? And uh, obviously BLM has discredited itself by the actions of their, their leadership, which explains uh, the, the precipitous falls in uh, support by the public for BLM. Uh, interestingly enough, France is going through the same thing right now. Uh, the the exact same thing. They're having fire riots and uh, uh, claims of police brutality. Uh, BLM was an organization that was founded on the idea that Black people are, uh, are always being constantly being murdered by police, when in fact a critical thinker would say, well, what are the, what's the, what's the data? And there was something like six, six police killings of black people in uh, 2019 or 2020. And uh, this was infinitesimally small compared to how many killings of police killings of white people there were. So, the, the basis upon which it is founded was dishonest. The leaders were dishonest in that they took the money uh, that was donated to buy real estate for themselves. And uh, uh, so, you know, but still what remains to me is what, what, why was it that there was such a tight alignment between BLM and Antifa and the fact we don't know much about Antifa is a little scary. Why hasn't the, uh, that'd be my question for Christopher Ray of the FBI. Why don't, why haven't we heard anything about prosecuting these Antifa uh, people that are in Seattle and Portland? Yeah, definitely some points to ponder. Um, I, you know, and to add to what you just said, I thought, you know, I mentioned at the outset, you know, the number of small businesses that were destroyed and and in a lot of these urban areas, it was primarily in the inner cities. A few were in the suburbs, but most of them or a lot of them were black owned businesses, which seems on face to be in direct opposition 
to what their mantra was all about, that Black Lives Matter. In fact, some of Black people got killed in these riots and Black-owned companies got destroyed. Some of them never came back. Yes. You know, so it leads me to believe that there was more to Black, and the number of cities and the the audacity and the sheer destruction caused by BLM leads me to believe, even in light of what's going on in France, that there's more going on to what BLM was all about uh, than 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 what we're being told. And 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 is government in alignment somehow with this divisiveness? And and why did so many corporations jump on board and fund this kind of nonsense? Right. Right. I'm, I'm upset. Uh, Apple gave uh, $100 million or something on the order to BLM. What an absolute farce. That means that every iPhone that you and I buy, about 5 or $10 of that iPhone go to a Black Lives Matter. And, and that's just, I don't want to support that. Uh, it's almost enough if, if Apple's products weren't so far superior to what Bill Gates has ever come up with, uh, I would have I would have dropped Apple long ago, but I'm I I don't know. Uh, I guess this is I can weather the storm and see if they, Apple doesn't get a new CEO that's more interested in their customers and uh, in, in their performance of their products rather than social causes. Yeah, you know, you raise a good point with that comment, Dan. You know, you can go online and you can see all of the companies, like I said before, iconic brands that supported this narrative that was taking place, that somehow blacks were being specifically targeted by law enforcement. And I believe that the focus for corporate for corporations needs to be on their products and services and on their customer bases and not on ideologies that divide the people. Um Something well, really creepy. Yes, I, I think that. that there's been some very, very bombastic uh, examples of of where there have been missteps in, in this way uh, through alignment with social causes like uh, the Bud Light, which has now become uh, a phenomenon and, and, and a case study in business school. <laughs> Every business school is studying what happened to Bud Light. And they're not going to recover. And the fact that Budweiser used to be an American company out of St. Louis, uh, it's now a Belgian-owned company that has little or nothing to do with uh, with America. And the ir irony is that everybody in Europe, they prefer a, a hoppier type flavored beer, a much more stout, and they consider American beer to be loggers to be piss water, which it just is a matter of of uh, national taste. Um, it, it's interesting that Anheuser-Busch even functions in the United States. And I think that they have really, uh, <laughs> I, it was heartwarming to those of us who, who are tired of having this crap shoved down our throats. But uh, Nonetheless, uh, they still proceed to, st to step in it, along with Target and a number of other companies that decide to join the social causes, which is the boards of directors ought to be uh, eliminated and fired entirely at Anheuser-Busch that ever allowed that to happen, at Target that ever allowed uh, the uh, tuckable swimwear or young children to be uh, uh, not only, again, presented, but in your face presented the first and through displays as you enter the store that you cannot, uh, you can't miss. So uh, I have, I, as a former business manager and uh, 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 this successfully turned around many companies, uh, these are culture changes that need to happen and they need to happen at the top. And quite frankly, if I had been hired at uh, Anheuser-Busch, uh, my first uh, first action would have been to uh, eliminate the board of directors. 
you know, it's interesting you say that, and it brings to light when you think about the sheer number of companies that are supporting social narratives. Um, and a lot of those boards and a lot of those CEOs are still there in positions. You know, some lower level management people have been let go, I think, more as a band aid uh, view. And then they've come out with these commercials that try to say that, hey, we're not all that bad. This is what we do. But the reality is, because of the scope, it leads me to believe, and not putting on a conspiracy theory hat, just critical thinking, that there's something more at play here. Because it's almost like they're intentionally going out of their way to destroy iconic brands, and a lot of them American brands, for something else. I mean, look at Disney and what Disney has done to alienate the people who oh. love Disney. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's a distaste for Disney that's amazing. It's amazing how such a, co a company that was literally loved by everyone and everyone looked forward to the next film release by Disney and to have it turn into uh, this, this dribble uh, for social causes that nobody supports. Nobody supports those causes, except all you can assume is that somehow this is this is a, a system that was designed to keep those in power, to keep them in power, uh, and uh, to uh, to dispense with the marginalized uh, uh, Americans, which represent yeah, you know, it's kind of percent of the population. So why why on earth? Would a brand say, well, I can do without 40% of our market share? I mean, this is companies work hundreds of years, not hundreds, decades to, to achieve th these market shares that can be destroyed overnight, literally, by some ill advised, uh, woke CEOs or boards that seem to be. Uh, think that it's critically important, more important to to push an ideology than it is to push a product that the public will like and respond to. Yeah, you know, it's beyond anybody that has that uses logic or reason to even think something like that would happen from a business sense. You know, there's an old axiom that's been around for a long, long time, centuries, and it's about it's called divide and conquer and anytime you can create division amongst the populace you and you you can um inspire fear if that's the right word but you can you can generate fear and anytime that there's fear in a populace they're easier to manipulate and to control so it's almost like there's this there's some plan somewhere, maybe, and I know I'm not half baked. That that is, I'm not going to say directing this, but there's a reason for this. There's a there's a reason that a, that a board, whether they're out of touch or not, you know, it would seem that if anybody looked at the model of Bud Light, they would immediately reverse direction, go with the majority of their customer base the way they they feel. And end this ludicrous nonsense. So that that tells me that there's something more at play here than meets right. the eye. And I think that's very a good example of critical thinking, John. Uh, congratulations, but of course you do it all the time, so I'm certainly not surprised. But yeah, what if? Here's just a what if. What if the military came to? Uh, came to Budweiser, Anheuser-Busch, and said, uh, if uh, if you don't support uh, this new woke uh, ideology, uh, you're going to lose every contract with the U.S. military you have through every PX and every base, every uh, uh, base in America and overseas. Uh, gee, that would certainly be something that a board would consider, I think, and went before making such a suicidal move. So yes, I think that there, there, we probably, critical thinking says, whatever the story is, we don't have the full story, but whatever the story is, the story stinks. Yeah, if, you know what, if you, if you smell a rat, chances are there's a rat somewhere. And, 
it's amazing how, you know, it's a good thing to know the difference between misinformation and disinformation. And usually they're part of a program somewhere. We can look at the, the, the our own government's counterintelligence programs to, to uh, create dissension within the Black Panther Party themselves, the Christian coalition, the American Indian movement. You know, what was that all about without digressing? You know, the, the government was in there doing something to make these organizations appear radical. Um, and so you just wonder about that. I agree with you, Dan. We're not getting the whole picture. I say that these were big mouths, loudly misbehaving. They got compensated greatly for it. And nobody's being held accountable. So being said, what can the average citizen or the average consumer do about all of this? And does it matter? Uh, well, I, I think that as consumers, it has, uh, we need to respond uh, to those companies that are that are professing these anti uh, these woke uh, agendas. They need to respond with boycotts, and boycotts have, have shown to be the strength of uh, it, it, of the right and the conservative movement that oppose this. And the success of the of the Bud Light uh, action was uh, was empowering to to people like you and I that really uh, we talk and speak and and our voices just disappear into the dark abyss into the the world of Titanic where no one is around to hear. Um, so it's. Well, I yeah, I agree with you. The power is with the people. I will always believe that, that if people use their common sense, use logic and reason, critically think as we support that concept, that maybe we can make a difference. Um, I'd still like to see somebody held accountable because all that money came from somewhere and there's somebody living large off of nonprofit donations. And if you and me had done that, I can tell you where we'd be. So Somebody's protecting somebody somewhere, and we would just like to see justice served. You know, we talk about justice for George Floyd. What about justice for all those companies that were destroyed? Exactly. And the irony of that is that the enemy, I knew ever since I owned a small business, uh, that the enemy of small business is large business. So this was a big boon to big business in the United States, the entire, all these riots that put these mom and pop shops out where people have to shop at Walmart, have to shop at Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, yeah, so good point. It, you know it's what? it's yeah. a battle and and, uh, and the, the, the proponents of big business are one up. Yeah, and that's, you know, which could go into a different conversation totally during the COVID lockdowns. You know, why were the big boxes allowed to stay open, but all the small businesses in general were forced to close their doors? So anyhow, uh, like to any final thoughts, Dan, before we close this out? Uh, just, again, use the gifts that God gave you, your ability to think critically and look at situations that when something doesn't make sense, to you, it's because you don't have all the information. Uh, fill in the blanks, and as you fill them in, things will become more clear. Well, there you have it from my co-host, Dan Ploger. Uh, thank you for listening to another episode of Mind Matters, where we have conversation and we offer logic and reason to some of the things that we're faced with. All I can say is this, stay alert, stay alive. Give those narratives some due diligence and then go with your heart. Go with what you think is right and not with what you're being told. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, John. Thank you for listening to another episode of Mind Matters. Remember, your mind matters, but only if you use it. Stay alert. Stay alive. Keep your eyes wide open.